Dr. Austin is director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, which was launched in 2011. He joined us from his home outside of Washington, D.C. There's this, this uh, really cornucopia of fundamental scientific advances that we've seen during my professional lifetime, uh, but most of those have not reached patients. Uh, the, the process that we have now for developing and deploying novel interventions, and by that I mean drugs, devices, behavioral interventions, is, is remarkably inefficient. Um, you know, the numbers are quite striking, taking around 10 to 15 years uh, to go from a fundamental observation to a drug that might be approved, just as an example, and another 15 years uh, to get to all the patients who need it. And, and, and there's never been an organization in the world before focused on that problem. Uh, like how do we speed that up? How do we make that more efficient? Um, uh, and, and hopefully over time, not only faster, but because it's more efficient, um, perhaps some cheaper as well. There's a lot that we know, but actually a lot more that we don't know. Dr. Austin is trained as a physician and geneticist. He joined NIH in 2002 and founded the agency's Chemical Genomic Center. Let me ask you about vaccines because uh, everyone's talking about it right now. Yeah. And, and you've been in this uh, business for a long time to see the speed yeah. of trying to produce a vaccine this quickly. What's right. that been like and uh, how close are we, do you think? Well, uh, you, you've I, I probably all seen uh, Dr. Fauci talk about this, who's the head of a sister institute here at the NIH, the Infectious Disease Institute, a uh, close friend. Uh, talk about this as well as people in the White House Task Force and Operation Warp Speed and others. Uh, uh, and, and what they said, and I think this is right, is that it is very likely we will have at least one vaccine uh, extant by the first of the year. Uh, but, the, but the problem is going to be uh, two things. Uh, one is how effective is the vaccine? And we don't know that yet. Um, and, and, and secondly, uh, how durable is it? How long does it last? And, and then thirdly, how do we make enough doses for all the people who need it? With the logistical issues of making a billion doses of, of anything new is it, quite extraordinary. And it's something that the, the medical field has never had to deal with before. Uh, the, the, the reason that I think myself and a lot of other people uh, are, are optimistic here is that uh, the, we're, we're, the whole community is taking the uh, uh, many eggs, not uh, in many baskets approach. Uh, that is that there are altogether about 100 different vaccines that are being developed. There's eight or 10 of them that are in very advanced development that look very promising in, in animal tests or early human tests. Um, and while we don't know, of course, what's gonna happen, this could fail, um, the, 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 all the signs so far look very good. And the fact that there are so many different approaches, so all of these 10, just as to give you an example, the, the 10 leading ones, they're taking quite different approaches, in some cases radically different approaches, to induce immunity. So even if one fails, it's likely that, that all of them will not fail. Dr. Austin's team at NCATS developed a data sharing resource called the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or NC3 for short. Collaborators contribute COVID-related clinical data to help answer important research questions about the virus. I can remember when we were on the air first talking about what was going on in Wuhan and we called it a mysterious pneumonia. And, and I remember when it started to like flare up, uh, talking to an epidemiologist and I said, well, how long is this thing gonna last? And will it still be around? And she said, oh, you'll still be talking about it in June. But I don't think any of us at that time thought it would just spread so wildly no. around the world. No. And because no. of that speed, um, suddenly you're thrust into this position where you've got to try and figure things out in a very short period of time. And when I say you, I mean the medical community. Talk to me right. about how difficult that's been. Well, it, it, it's, it, it has been uh, ex extraordinarily difficult in some ways, um, but it also has led to some very positive behaviors that I hope will persist actually after the pandemic is over, uh, perhaps a silver lining to 
the awful things that this pandemic has brought on. Uh, that is that, you know, patients who, who have a, a variety of illnesses, cancer, uh, ALS, uh, other horrible diseases, and you probably know there's 7,000 diseases that affect the human family, only about 5% of which have any treatment. And those people feel that urgency every day that we now feel about COVID. So for the first time in my lifetime, the whole world feels the urgency that many patients feel every day. What we've seen in response to that uh, global understanding and, and, and attitude is a level of collaboration on a level that is unprecedented. Uh, you know, scientists and institutions and companies uh, tend to be pretty competitive and they tend to be pretty secretive. And until a discovery is made and published or a drug is made and out on the market, um, there's very little sharing traditionally. And that's just quite inefficient. A lot of people doing the same thing that if they shared the information, uh, progress would be made a lot faster. That has happened in response to this need for speed uh, in COVID uh, on a level that I thought I would never see. The development of a COVID-19 vaccine, however, won't mean an automatic end to the pandemic. The head of the World Health Organization warned that a vaccine alone would not be a silver bullet. I think this is one of the things that people, they, well, I'm gonna wait around for a vaccine as though it's, it is the silver bullet. And when you look at the flu vaccines, and, and you know a lot more about this than I do, but I think that the, the rate of percentage, I think of effectiveness is roughly 40 to 60%. Um, this assumption that uh, I get the vaccine and, and I don't need to wear a mask and I can go about life and life is all, that's kind of a fallacy, isn't it? Probably. We don't know yet, but for all the reasons that you're suggesting, it, it probably is a fallacy. And I'll just throw a few things at you. Uh, one, the common cold, about 15% of common colds are caused by other kinds of coronaviruses. So we are exposed to these things all the time. But natural immunity clearly does not uh, induce a, an effective or durable response. So the next year we can get the same infection all over again or a slightly different one. Flu is the same way. And the vaccines that are available, as you said, are only about 50% roughly uh, effective. That's why a lot of people think that the coronavirus vaccine, this COVID-19 vaccine or SARS-CoV-2, that's the name of the virus vaccine, will only be about that effective as well. The other, of course, issue, of course, is that we, a lot of people have unfortunately forgotten, at least for the time being, how difficult it is for people to actually agree to get the flu vaccine. Only about half of people get the flu vaccine every year, and everybody knows about flu. And, and so will everyone actually get the coronavirus vaccine when it's, or one of them, when they're available? What's also unclear now is whether the novel coronavirus will be a cyclical event like the seasonal flu. You brought up the flu vaccine. I get one every year, so I'm, I'm yep, one of the two. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking about that uh, because there's a certain period of time where you get the flu vaccine and there's a flu season. And yes. November seems to be that yep. kind of time. And there's yep. concerns about a second wave of COVID. Um, worst yep. case scenario, best case scenario as we move towards the winter months, because I know there's a lot of concern on the medical front with regards to COVID as a result of that. Sure. Well, and this has been one of the many, many surprises with, uh, with this coronavirus. You know, when uh, you may remember uh, ancient history back in um, May, <laughs> three months ago, uh, the, 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 the common wisdom uh, that, that I believed and many of us believe was because of the epidemiology and the seasonal, the seasonality of, of most coronaviruses and flu, we all thought that, uh, that we were gonna have a break during the summertime, that, that the, the, the rate of COVID infection was gonna go down over the summer. And so we really needed to focus on return to school, uh, the, the new academic year, uh, and, and there was a big, the opposite happened. You know, the, the number, if you, if you remember the, the graph, the number of COVID cases was going down quite uh, uh, steadily uh, until about the end of June. And then it skyrocketed at that point to levels previously un, unseen. And they're beginning to come down a little bit now. 
but there was no summer break. So we don't even know whether this virus is going to be seasonal. And if it isn't, then one will not be able to have, there won't be a COVID-19 season, right? The way there is a flu season. So we won't be able to tell people, well, get your COVID-19 vaccine in November or what have you. Uh, if it is a year-long virus, uh, then we have a, an even bigger problem on our hands. Uh, and, and that's why people need to be uh, vigilant about uh, uh, keeping up with the news, thanks to programs like yours and others, uh, that we are actively learning about this virus as time goes on. And, and you have to combine the potential seasonality with the fact that this virus, or sorry, this vaccine may only last for three, four, five, six months. So then you can imagine being in a situation potentially where one would hypothetically need to get a vaccine every six months for life, which is a situation we've never been in before. The current pandemic has been compared to the 1918 flu pandemic, which killed 50 million people worldwide and infected roughly 500 million people, about one third of the global population. What about uh, the the amnesia that we tend to have, uh, if, yeah. if this does go away five, 10 years from now, suddenly it, it's not something we should be spending money on. It seems frivolous. This yes. is something we really have to concentrate on going forward, right? Yes, 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 and yes. And I very much hope that this time we've learned, uh, I, I, many of us, uh, including Tony Fauci, probably most loudly, uh, but also people at BARDA and other places, have been arguing for years that we know from history this will happen again. So we need to prepare. This is not something that, that we can view as a low uh, probability event, and we can gamble on it not happening. It is going to happen. And actually, if you look at the, the frequency of these, the periodicity between the last pandemic and the next one, it, that, that period is decreasing. We just, in our time, that we, during my professional lifetime, uh, just among others, we've dealt with HIV, the bird flu, the swine flu, Japanese encephalitis virus, uh, the, the, the um, uh, H1N1 virus, you remember that, it's another, another flu, Zika, Ebola, and now here we are here. And there are others called chikungunya and many others that, that uh, you know, are, are, are a little bit more obscure. Unfortunately, history is not encouraging. History is not encouraging on this. And that is that the kind of amnesia you're talking about came on very rapidly. You know, the, the, another thing that human, that Americans are, famous for is short, short attention span. So how long will people remember this? Uh, and how, will, they, will they be willing to pay for? Will our policymakers be willing to, uh, to prioritize uh, uh, um, uh, supporting this kind of work? Gosh, I hope so. Otherwise, you and I are going to be back here in five years having a discussion about COVID-25. And, and um, I know you, neither you or nor I wants to be here to do that. Well, uh, Dr. Chris Dawson, I'll, I'll look forward to interviewing you anytime. <laughs> Let's hope it's not about that. I, I really appreciate yes. your time. Lots of other things we should talk about. Thanks very much. Sure, it's great to be with you.